There's not any kind of sort of liberal democratic discourse going on there right now. It's all about who has the biggest gun. Nobody really cares about what the ordinary people's opinions is, and that doesn't really play into a factor. It's a war, um, and it's about uh, who fights better. It's not about what, what the ordinary people want anymore. Hi, I'm Simon Ostrovsky, and I've been a reporter with Vice News for just over a year now, and most of that year I've spent covering uh, the war in Ukraine. It started out in Crimea, it spread to the east of the country, and today we're taking questions from some of our viewers uh, about the conflict there and about uh, Ukraine's relations with Russia. So let's get started. Hey, Simon. So thanks for coming on. Uh, the first caller who I want you to speak with is Anton, who is uh, calling us on Skype. So let's say hey. Hey, Anton. Hey, Simon. How are you doing? Good, good, good. What's your question? Uh, my question on Twitter was, yes or no, are there Russian troops in eastern Ukraine at this moment? Um, it's hard for me to say if they're there right now. I, I suspect that probably they are, but I mean, I can say pretty definitely that there have been Russian troops in Ukraine over the course of the conflict. Acting service members, I think it's inarguable, the um, mountain of evidence for um, Russian direct involvement in eastern Ukraine is so, so huge uh, that it's really undeniable. A couple of uh, very trusted uh, journalist friends of mine, um, Sean Walker and Roland Oliphant, actually witnessed a column of uh, Russian armored personnel carriers cross into Ukraine through a hole in a fence um, from the Rostov region of Russia. Um, so for me, that, you know, that, that happened last summer when they saw that. Um, for me, that was enough uh, to, to say definitively that the Russians have been in Ukraine. But, you know, there's been tons of other evidence as well. Um, the way that the Russians uh, seem to be operating when they're using the army and not, you know, just financing the separatists or supporting them or sending volunteers in or mercenaries or whatever you want to call it. But when they're actually using, you know, the Russian army formations that come in from across the border, it's usually at key moments in the fight when it seems like the separatists are going to lose a battle. So that's happened twice now, as far as we know, uh, over the summer in the city of Ilovaisk. That, why that battle was so important is because Ilovaisk is right in the middle between Donetsk and Lugansk, the two biggest cities held by the separatists. The Ukrainians were uh, successfully um, cleaving those two cities apart by uh, coming in from the south and coming in from the north. They were about to join forces. Uh, in fact, they had joined forces in Ilovaisk. Um, effectively, temporarily separating the two cities, and that's when the Russian troops were sent in. Um, you know, we know that from the social media posts that the Russian soldiers themselves did. We know that from, from the equipment that they left behind. And then the next time, uh, oh, and we also know that from uh, some of the video that's been put out there of soldiers who were captured um, by the Ukrainians and then eventually sent back home. Um, the second time that happened was over the winter uh, in Dibaltseva. That was another, another critical moment. The reason Dibaltseva was a strategic town was because there's a major railroad and um, uh, highway hub there. That's another city that's in between Lugansk uh, and uh, Donetsk, and so it's important for similar, similar reasons. Um, the Ukrainians put thousands of troops there, hundreds of vehicles there, and they were dead set on holding the city, um, but they just couldn't uh, uh, face the, the onslaught of uh, what turned out to be Russian tanks from the uh, Buryatia region, um, a very professional tank battalion uh, that came in for not very long and then came out again, so a sort of crack force. I hope that answers uh, so your just question. Wondering, I'm just wondering, uh, do they wear like Russian uniforms or like official Russian uniforms or are they dressed in like Novorossiya DPR uniforms when they're on the ground? So generally the practice has been that they take off all of their patches, they wear non-standard uniforms for the Russian army, sometimes they'll wear like a mishmash of army surplus. Um, sometimes they won't really bother with uh, trying to disguise it very much and making it look too Mad Max. They'll just take off the flags and the patches that identify what units they're from. Um, one thing that most of them will do is wear a white armbands. Um, that was uh, during, for example, the battle for Debaltseva. That was the uh, marking that the pro-Russia forces, so both the uh, regular Russian army and the separatist forces, used to differentiate themselves from the Ukrainian um, military. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, they're supposed to hand over their phones, their documents, all of their patches before they come across the border. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Thanks for the question. Who do we have next? Hey, Simon. Next, uh, I have a tweet that I want you to, t uh, to take a look at. Uh -huh. Eric wants to know, uh, which do you think would be more beneficial to Ukraine, U.S. neutrality or increased U.S. military support? Um, okay, uh, well, I don't actually know what would be more ben beneficial because it's hard to you know, predict the future. Um, but I can tell you what um, the Ukrainians want and what they've been saying repeatedly. The Ukrainians want much more support and they feel like they're not getting it. They want weapons, they want arms, and they want a lot of them. Um, but uh, this administration under uh, President Barack Obama has been unwilling to uh, provide that. Um, Obama right now has all of the political backing that he would need within the United States to give Ukraine weapons. Um, both uh, houses of Congress uh, have approved giving uh, Ukraine lethal weapons. It's a bipartisan uh, issue, so it's not you know a Democrats versus Republicans thing. Both parties um, have said, if you want to give them weapons, we'll let you do that. But um, Obama, up until now, has decided not to do that. And, and you know, it's really up to him to make that decision. And I think the reason that that's happening is because he's sort of uh, still living out the promises that he made in 2008 when he was elected, um, not to embroil the United States uh, in uh, overseas conflicts. And you know, it was all about drawing down in Iraq and Afghanistan and not drawing up in, in, in another place um, somewhere else. And so I think it's really, for the United States, it's not about Ukraine and it's not about Russia. It's really, it's about domestic policy. And uh, the president wants to be um, somebody who transforms uh, society within the U.S. and um, who wants to stay uh, at arm's uh, length from uh, the sort of various uh, problems that we have around the world, including Ukraine. Great. So uh, thanks for the question, Eric. And uh, we have another person who wants to ask you a question. Uh, this is Alex on Skype. Let's say it, Alex. Hey, Alex. How's it going, Simon? Good. So I had a question regarding public opinion in eastern Ukraine, kind of the civilians there. I wanted to know, do they tend to sympathize with and support the separatist movement more so than the Ukrainian government, or vice versa, or perhaps do they just want the fighting to end? Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's really hard to gauge because... Um, the people who are left in eastern Ukraine is a self-selecting group. You know, everybody who doesn't support the separatists uh, probably left out of fear already. So the people who remain behind um, uh, are either just too poor to leave or actually do support, um, you know, if, if not the separatists, then at least closer integration with Russia. And there are quite a few of those people um, about. The other problem is those people who may have stayed behind um, you know, and didn't have any opportunities to get somewhere safer, uh, are pretty unlikely to want to express uh, their feelings, their criticism of the, of the separatists if they have any criticism for them, because that'd be a very dangerous thing to do. There's not any kind of sort of liberal democratic discourse going on there right now. It's all about who has the biggest gun. Nobody really cares about what the ordinary people's opinions is, and that doesn't really play into a factor. It's a war, um, and it's about uh, who fights better. It's not about what, what the ordinary people want anymore, um, unfortunately. Nobody's taking polls to, to ask them their opinions. Um, but, you know, every once in a while you do meet a brave person willing to criticize the authorities, you know, on both sides, because on the Ukrainian side it can be um, pretty risky to uh, criticize the Ukrainian government, too, um, in the area that the war is being conducted. So um, we met an uh, old lady in the village of Shurokina, she didn't just tell us um, you know, that she was unhappy with the separatists. She told uh, the spokesman for the uh, separatist military to his face on camera that she wanted them to leave and that she wanted her town to remain a part of Ukraine. Um, but that's something that happens very, very rarely. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Alex. So, uh, Simon, we got another person on Skype that I want you to talk to. Uh, this is David. So let's say hey to David. Hi, David. Hi. Hi, Simon. Great. Glad to see you. Uh, can you elaborate on the differences in how Western media, Russian media, and Ukrainian media cover the same events? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Russian and Ukrainian media, that question is easy to answer. They just uh, cover things completely diametrically. 
Um, I think there's a lot more nuance in the way Western media cover events. I wouldn't say that there's only any one thing that they're saying. I don't think everybody's saying, oh, the Russians are bad and the Ukrainians are gr great. I think, you know, even within the confines of just one publication, um, you'll have lots of different articles uh, uh, over time pointing out, you know, different problems on both sides. Um, and I think that's the great thing about, uh, you know, the sort of uh, freedom of speech that we've been able to develop. Um, in in, in uh, Ukraine and Russia, just like yesterday, I was looking at my Twitter feed and I took a screenshot um, of a couple of tweets that happened to line up next to each other. And uh, Michael, you can put them on the screen. So the top one is from a Ukrainian uh, publication. And the bottom one is from Life News, which is a Russian uh, TV channel. And the, uh, basically, this is about the... Um, the special services officers uh, that Ukraine alleges to have captured just a few days ago. And the top headline says, um, reads, the confessions uh, of uh, Russian GRU special services soldiers. And the bottom one reads, confessions obtained under torture um, of uh, rebels, you know, from the militia. So basically, they're just saying completely different things here. Uh, and, that's, and that's a day-to-day -day thing. That's very normal. It happens, it happens every day. The Ukrainians uh, play it one way. Uh, the Russians play it another way. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So, hey, uh, speaking of media, Simon, we just got this tweet from Garrett, who uh, wants to know, um, what's the attitude towards journalists in uh, separatist areas? Um, are they willing to talk? Um, well, the separatists are definitely willing to talk to journalists, uh, and journalists um, are allowed uh, to visit the separatist areas even though they're treated with suspicion. Uh, and I think the reason for that is quite interesting, actually. Um, it's because the separatists' views don't always line up with the Kremlin's views. And even though they're supported by Russia, financed by Russia, armed by Russia, uh, they're actually a lot more radical um, in, in what they want to get out of the conflict. Um, they want to continue fighting and expand their territory um, you know, the Kremlin doesn't always want, want that. And the Kremlin controls its media. So the Russian journalists who are in eastern Ukraine, even though they interview the separatist leadership every day, um, they, uh, the separatists don't get to control, you know, which part of their interviews are published. And so the words that fall in line with the Kremlin view are the ones that get published and not some of the more radical things that the separatists might want to get out there. And so even though Perhaps they don't trust us, uh, the journalists from the West. Um, they like to give us interviews because um, they know that their uh, radical views will get out uh, into the ether through us. Cool. So um, I hope that answered your question, Garrett. Um, Simon, we've got one more person on Skype for you to talk to, uh, and this is Michael. So let's say hey. Hey, Michael. Good afternoon. Do you believe that there is a diplomatic solution to the conflict, or is a return to full hostilities inevitable? I mean, I think there's a, there could be a diplomatic solution, and there could be a return to hostilities, and there could be both uh, at the same time. And in fact, usually a diplomatic uh, solution uh, comes out of hostilities, because uh, essentially one side realizes that uh, it can't continue on, and it has to come to some kind of terms. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion over uh, what Russia is actually trying to get out of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. And I think many people saw what happened in Crimea, the annexation, joining it to Russia. And I think what Russia wants out of eastern Ukraine is actually very different. And you had the foreign minister, uh, Lavrov, come out the other day and say that he sees eastern Ukraine as part of remaining part of Ukraine. You know, Vladimir Putin said that before. The prime minister, Medvedev, he's said that before. But the Russians, they've lost so much trust uh, over the last year and a half um, from uh, people around the world because of their actions in Ukraine that nobody actually believes them when they say that they want eastern Ukraine to remain a part of Ukraine. But it's the one time when what they're saying is actually true. The thing is, is that they want it to remain part of Ukraine under their terms. Um, for now, they're happy with the status quo. Uh, with their control over the behavior of the separatists, that means that they can uh, use the war uh, to put pressure on the authorities in central Kiev whenever they want to. So say, let's say the, the uh, Ukrainians want to join the European Union. I, I know that's a long way off, but like, it's just an example. Um, the, the Russians can uh, turn up the heat in eastern Ukraine. 
um, fight back the Ukrainian soldiers, uh, put the Ukrainian authorities under so much pressure that they're going to you know, back down from their um, desire to integrate further with the West. That's how that tool works. And by extension, they can also influence Western countries. So for Russia, they're happy to have um, Eastern Ukraine as their Trojan horse within Ukraine. They don't actually want to have to spend the money on joining it to Russia proper. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Do we have anything else? Uh, well, Simon, you know, I think uh, we've got, uh, we've covered a lot of ground, so why don't we call it a day? Why don't you say goodbye to everyone at home? All right, thank you everybody for your questions. Thanks for watching, and uh, next week we've got another on the line with another reporter, so catch up with us then. <laughs>